Hi, and welcome to another video. Um, so this video will be about the analytic rank of a tensor. And I think I'll actually make this the first of three videos. Um, I think I will, well, some of my videos get pretty long and this one would be like a two hour video, I think if I didn't split it up. Um, so I think I'll try to split into three. It's probably gonna be easier to, maybe it's not gonna be two hours, but, but like maybe three half an hour videos or something is still better than a one and a half hour video. All right, so um, it's, window. Um, so the analytic rank of a tensor. Okay. Also, you'll notice uh, if you're a longtime fan of this channel, um, uh, first of all, um, I can't believe you exist. Um, second of all, uh, you'll notice that the, the format of these videos are, uh, have changed a little bit. Um, that's because my computer died a uh, graceful, well, actually a very violent death and so i had to get a new one and my ipad doesn't connect to it um, anymore because i'm on linux now and so um i'm gonna have to get used to writing and not looking at my um, paper but that also means that you don't just see the top of my head so that's um yeah okay anyway so let's get started okay so um so well i mean i mean i can just talk in broad strokes what it's gonna be about so there's you know, um, tensors are a generalization of matrices, um, and they're kind of a scary thing um, to a lot of people in undergrad. I know they were very scary to me. And uh, I'm gonna kind of talk about what a tensor is, um, kind of talk about various notions of rank of a tensor, and then um, that that's what's gonna happen mostly today. And then the next uh, two videos will be about something called the analytic rank and how it relates to other notions of rank that we might be um, already interested in. So this first video is just about mostly definitions and sort of um, maybe some motivation. Okay, so there's there's um, there are various notions of rank of a matrix. So matrix. Rank. Okay, the one that the one that we're going to use and it might look weird to you at first is the following. So the rank um, an M by N matrix a is said to be to be rank one if there are vectors u uh, in f n and v in f n such that a is equal to u v transpose. Okay, so I mean use use um. Yeah, so I mean, if it's u transpose v, that's the dot product, right? So it's a number. Um, if you flip the, if you flip them around, then you get a, or the flip which ones get transposed, um, then you get a matrix, an n by n matrix. Okay, and so that's a rank one uh, matrix, and I mean, you can you can see that um, this rank one matrix, every every column is a linear com is is a linear um, combination of the first column, right? Just by the way that. Um, so, so it kind of corresponds to our, our idea of rank, like, yeah. Um, okay, so then the rank, rank of a general matrix, uh, A is the minimum K such that uh, a equals a one plus k, where each a i is a uh, rank one. Okay, so we can kind of—I mean, if you—if you're like me, when you first saw this definition, you can kind of see right away why a rank one matrix is a rank one matrix in the normal linear algebra sense. Okay, but it might not be so obvious why the rank of a general matrix here. I don't know if you can see my mouse. Um, the, oh no. The rank of a general matrix is um, the same here as it is in the normal way um, that we learn it in linear algebra. So we can, um, normally you, you learn in linear algebra that the rank of a matrix is the image, uh, the dimension of the image, right? Or the dimension of the column space. So, um, to see that this definition is the same, okay, let A be 
a rank uh, K matrix and K matrix and let B um, let's write them out B is B1 to B K um, sorry that's messy it says B1 up to BK let me copy um, B a basis of its column space all right, so this is rank K matrix in the original sense, uh, and sorry, the, the like um, your first course in linear algebra sense. Okay, so its column space has dimension K, and so that's its basis. Okay, and since every column A can be written um, as a linear combination. of vectors in B, there is a K by N matrix C such that K, uh, that, oops, whoopsie, A equals B, C. Okay, this is just, you know, a, a very long-winded way of saying you can change, um, you can write it in this basis, you change the basis, okay? Um, I hope that's right. Um, sorry if I'm just stating like wrong things. Okay, now, now letting uh, C1, CK, be the rows of C, okay, we have um, A, is equal to B one C one transpose plus B K C K transpose. All right, that kind of you can kind of see that, right? You just multiplied that. That's just expanding this thing out here. Okay, so the rank of A is at most A, but on the other hand. Um, if A is equal to U1, V1 transpose plus all the way up to um, U, K prime, V, V, K prime transpose, okay, or some K prime less than K, okay, then for all X in F to the N, we have Okay, AX would equal, well, you just write this out, so U1, V1, transpose X, plus all the way up to U, K prime, V, K prime, transpose X, okay? But, but since V1, V, I, transpose X, okay, is just a scalar for all one less than I less than K prime. Okay. We conclude that, all right, so um, U1 all the way up to UK prime span the image of A. All right? So we've shown that if if you could write it in any less than k, then the then then we would contradict our hypothesis. And where was the hypothesis? Um, here, that the column space had dimension k. Okay. All right. So um, now there's there's kind of a every matrix can be seen as a bilinear map by just taking um, so for any matrix so bilinear maps. Okay, so we're, we're about to get like closer to tensors here. Okay, so any matrix, if you, you take a matrix A, all right, you can see it as a matrix, uh, sorry, as a bilinear map uh, from F to the M cross F to the N um, to F, okay? Well, like, uh, well, let's give this a bilinear map, okay? By letting V, um, U, V um, equals I guess I wrote X and Y. Let's, let's do that. Oh, by the way, I'm gonna 
put notes in the description so that you don't have to like go I don't know sometimes reading my writing is pretty painful all right uh you just it's like this okay so you you, you plop the x on the left side and the y on the right side and well because it's a matrix you you, you can see that multiplying like this it's it's bilinear Okay, um, so I mean, what does bilinear mean? It means that it's linear in the first variable and it's also linear in the second variable. So x plus x prime y is equal to b x y plus b x prime y. And same if you were linear in the second variable. Okay, and um, what that doesn't mean is that if you have a, if you have x and y and you, you kind of like add them together in like f to the m plus n or whatever, you add them together, it's not linear, right? Because y, if you had y plus y prime, then it's actually, there'd, there'd be four terms here. Okay, so it's not, yeah. Okay, so now, now let's, how do I get a new page? Amazing. Um, so we extend this to um, an order D tensor, okay? And so this is uh, T, and you have vector spaces V1 up to VD to F, okay? And I don't know how to write this, but you, you know, it's a tensor if this is an order D tensor where T is multilinear. Okay, so multilinearity means just like with bilinearity, if you fix, um, so if you just, in one variable, you can, you fix all the other coordinates and you can add, like, um, if you put a sum in one of the variables, then it's, uh, it, it splits into the sum of t times those two. Okay, just like above. I'm saying it really badly, but it's like above, except with multiple, with more than two. So an order two tensor is a matrix. Um, that's how that Generalization works. Um, okay, and we will restrict ourselves. Cells to the case where um, each VI has the same dimension uh, N. Okay, so then, I mean, T goes from F to the N to the D to F. Okay, so that, that's the case we're going to work with. Okay, and, and, and then that means that there are, uh, thus there are, um, and the D scalars, S C. Uh, let me spell it, too bad. Um, we'll do this, J1, JD, for, um, for J1, JD in N. I write N with the square brackets to be the numbers 1 through N. Okay, so there are N to these scalars um, such that um, T of X1 up to XD is equal to um, J1 up to j d in n okay t j one j d this is a notation list x uh x one j one x d j d okay what am i trying to say so um when i write this subscript you know i, I didn't want to do a quadruple subscript or triple subscript, whatever that is. So um, that just means, sorry if I touch my mic, that just means the J, J1, the J first coordinate of X1 here, okay? Um, it, it, just stare at it for a little while and think about what you know when you have this matrix here, X, A, Y, right? You have a, two, you have a M by N, um, well, yeah, you have an N by N array of numbers, that's A, and then you know you can express x and y uh, b x y in terms of this n by an array of numbers and the coordinates x and y right you think about that and it's just 
the same thing, but in, multi, in um, more than two dimensions here. Okay? So just, yeah, it's, 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 it's not so hard. Okay, so, there, so there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between order D tensors and arrays of scalars, um, and D-dimensional arrays of, of scalars. Okay, now, what? Let's go back to my notes. Um, okay, so if, if, if T is an order D tensor, and uh, T prime is an order d prime tensor all right we can form a tensor form a tensor of order d plus d prime um, from the d plus d prime dimensional array the scalars all right, what is this? Well, you just multiply. So T of I1 of I, I D and then T prime, J1 up to J D prime. Okay, this is a array of scalars and I1 I D J1 J D are all n. All right, so that's n to the D plus D prime. Very simple. Okay, and this this tensor is in. Actually, I'm not sure why I put these in the notes. Okay, well, it it, it was good. It's good for you to know. This tensor is a uh, the tensor product t times t prime. I think I put it in because I thought I would need it, and if I'm not wrong, the rest of the video will not need this. Okay, so that was a digression. Okay, so the um, so we say now let's talk about so um. Hang on, we talked about rank before, right? Okay, well, in combinatorics, so I mean, I'll, I'll confess here now that the reason I'm doing this is because I like combinatorics, and in combinatorics, we um, sometimes, recently actually, um, have found a use uh, for a different type of rank called the partition rank. And so I'm gonna talk about the partition rank here. And by we, I mean not me or anyone I know, but Terry Tao. Um, Found this link between the well, he f uh, I, th I think if I'm getting the history right, uh, he did. S there was a result by uh, Ellenberg and Heisweit on the um, cap set problem, and then Terry Tao cleaned it up using something um, called the slice rank, and the slice rank is um, sort of a version of the partition rank. A partition rank is a generalization of the slice rank. Okay, so partition. Rank. I'll go into that at the end too, actually, about the link between partition rank and the cap set problem. Actually, not at the end, like soon. Okay, so we say that a an order D tensor, order D tensor has partition rank one. Uh, all right, one. If there exists, if there exists um, an A subset of D, okay, such that, uh, so I guess in order to censor T has partition rank one. If there exists A subset of D such that, um, such that, well, you, you need this, okay? A can't be zero, I mean, can't be empty or the whole set. Uh, and T1 of order size of A, and T2 of order uh, D, uh, D minus size of A, okay, such that um, T can be written as, okay, so T of x1 up to xd, okay, is t1, all right, and then here we're going to write it this way, so all the xi's, such that i is in a, all right, so by rights, I mean, this is like, I, I don't really know, you, you, you're going to, it's, there's going to be 
the size of a number of variables, but we're going to index them by the actual numbers in a. Or you can renumber them if you really want from one to the size of a. And then the same thing, but um, but but of everything that's not in a. Okay, so I mean, if you if you um, so this is this is that's order one, and then um, the partition rank. I'm gonna fit it on the same page. If he is minimum k such that t is equal to t one up to t k, and each of these are partition rank one. T i or p r k t i equals one. Okay, sorry, I squeezed it all in there. All right, same thing. So we we define a partition rank one matrix, and then um, a partition rank k matrix is just uh, it's the minimum k such that um, you can write it as a sum of partition rank um, k partition rank one matrices. Okay, so um, what does this mean? So for for um, a small order. So for order two, it's actually the same, right? So because of this condition here, zero up to d, um, a has to have size one. So you picked one of the variables. And then the other one, t2, has to be the other variable. So um, really um, a partition rank one two tensor is the same as a rank one two tensor. OK, and for, for three, it's not as simple, but this is where the slice rank kind of comes in. It's like you're. Um, either t1 or t2 has to be one of the variables, and then the other one has to be the other two. So it kind of like looks the same always. Okay, and so let's talk about that actually. So the, the case d equals 3. Okay, so the... Um, yeah, let's really talk about the motivation for partition rank. So, um, so it was used to study the cap set problem. So what is a cap set? So a cap set is a subset of um, the field on three elements such that for every triple um, x, y, z, um, oops, um, in a cube of pairwise distinct elements, um, x plus y plus z is um, not equal to zero. Okay, so you don't have a the set that you don't have any three different elements when that add up to zero. Okay, and that's kind of, I mean, it's kind of the same as arithmetic progressions in, um, in F3. Okay, so um, in, in 1984, so I'll history, 1984, um, Brown and Bueller um, showed that cap sets uh, have zero density. Okay, so what exactly did that say? So let's, let's call this theorem um, C for cap set. It's by these two people. B, I'm just going to say B. B. Okay. Um, 1986. Uh, 1986 or 84? It's either 84 or 86. My notes say both, so can't decide. For every delta greater than zero, there exists n such that um, if every subset a uh, f sorry f three to the n with um, more than delta three to the n elements um, contains a non-trivial solution to uh, x plus y plus z equals zero. Okay. So what I mean, um, 
it kind of means like like the size of a should be like small o of three to the n um whatever that means right because because how is n growing but yeah um like a is not a growing set but y okay anyway okay um so so later on um Meshulam gave bounds um so so Meshulam showed that we can, we only need n to be greater than 2 over delta which means that if a is a cap set okay then size of a is less than 2 times 3 to the n over n right, that's just flipping this around um Okay. Well, I mean, delta is so. I mean, delta is two over n, and then, and then, yeah. Okay, but but um, so this is just. I mean, this is definitely. So this is a strengthening, right? Because I mean, we we kind of wanted to say that it was small of three to the n, and this is certainly small of three to the n. We got um, way divided by n over here. Um, but it was suspected that you can actually change the exponent three to something smaller than three. Okay, and um, to do that. Um, to do that, Ellenberg, so it's 2017, uh, Ellenberg, uh, I think it's pronounced like Heisweid or something in Dutch. Okay. Uh, show that it's, it's, you can do that. So you, you can take C, uh, it's small, big O, I guess, of C to the N, where C is less than three. I forget what it is. I think it's like 2.7. Or something and let's sketch the idea okay of terry tau so terry tau restructured the proof in terms of the partition rank okay, and i'm just gonna sketch it out um before i sketch it out i mean this is the end of the video so you can just stop here if you don't want to know about this wait this is not the end of the video give me a sec no it's not the end of the video i'll, I'll put like a little um timestamps at the bottom so you can skip to the next section if you don't care um but what i actually recommend is to go find um tim gower's videos on the cap set problem where he actually does the whole thing so i think it's like two videos it's probably close to like over an hour and um it's really good it's sort of it's the whole solution to the cap set problem in terms of slice rank and um so that's really good but we'll just sketch it here because it's it's important to us so we'll spend like five minutes of sketch to sketch it here Okay, so we're given a subset of f three to the n. Okay, right now we just it's just any subset. Okay, we let t from v three to f three. Okay, so I mean, what's v? V is f three to the f three to the n. Okay, be given by um, f of e a e b e c is equal to 1 if a plus b plus c is equal to 0 and 0 uh, otherwise. Okay. And what, what are e, a, e, b, c? So e, a of x is equal to uh, 1 if x is equal to a and 0 otherwise. Okay. And I didn't tell you what happens if this EA, so I mean, let, let's just look at this a little bit more. So each EA, I mean, so sorry, each of these coordinates is a member of V, and V is all the functions from F3 to the N to F3. Okay, so so EA is a function from F3 to the N to F3. Um, okay, and we didn't tell you what to do with all the other ones, but you can just extend by linearity, right? Because any function from F3 to the N to F3 uh, can be expressed in terms of like by linearity, there's only one way to um, to make this a multilinear map, right? Because it needs to be linear in each argument. Okay, so now for a tensor, so hmm, for 
tensor um, T from F X D to F. Okay. We say that a set A subset of X is an independent set um, if okay I guess it's an independent set sorry in T it depends on T in T if um, we have T T of I1 up to ID so this is remember the um, coefficient in that array of scalars that's equivalent or that's associated to T if this thing is non-zero, okay, it's the same thing as i1 is equal to id, okay? What this kind of means is that um, a is an independent set is if you if you take the, uh, if you just take the subset a of this tensor, um, then it's diagonal, kind of. Um, uh, yo, sorry, sorry, this is for all i1, the id, and a. All right, so if you just look at the a, like, I mean, you can have whatever you want elsewhere, but if you just look at the, like, in the, the, um, rows indexed by a, it's like sort of a diagonal tensor. Okay? Um, so then, now what do you do? So, I'll just sketch out. So we give an upper bound. So remember, we want to give an upper bound on A if A is a cap set. So on cap sets by going uh, 1. So if A contains no non-trivial solutions, to x plus y plus z equals zero, then a is an independent set in T. Okay, and that, that's kind of just from the definition of T. We're we're gonna do that. Or did I say T or does they have okay like why do we call this T? Okay. <laughs> um okay then if Two, um, if A is an independent set in a T, then the partition rank of T is greater than or equal to A. Okay, and then finally, okay, we just need to show that we give an upper bound. So I'll say it vaguely, the partition rank is low. So that's usually just an ad hoc um, argument for the partition rank, rank being below something. Okay, and so the goal of this, the next two videos, okay, so in the remaining part of this video I'm going to define the analytic rank finally. Um, that's the title of this video. We're going to show that you can kind of do this, or there's, there's, an, there's an argument to be had that you can kind of do this with the analytic rank. Okay, meaning that, well, three, you still have to um, more or less it's like 2 so if you have an independent set in T then the analytic rank is also going to be greater than A and that means that you can you can um, use the analytic rank moreover the analytic rank is actually we're going to show it that it's low it's it's bounded above by the partition rank all right so even though we may not have an ad hoc method to show that the uh, analytic rank is low it actually I mean it actually is lower. So if we could con if we could find a proof that the analytic rank is below certain a certain um, value, then we would have a um, we would have a, sort of an independent proof uh, of all these statements. Okay. So I I, I'm, I I babbled a lot without even saying what the analytic rank is. So let's let's show that. So the analytic. Rank. Um, okay, so it, it was introduced in 2011 by Gowers. 
and wolf. Okay. And it's going to be Fourier analytic in nature. So I, I hope I'm not going to get... I hope this doesn't require like too much background. But um, so we require f to be finite. Okay. And let pi be any non-trivial additive character. So what is that? Um, that's just a... Uh, um, it's going to be a homomorphism from uh, f to um, to c, from the additive group of f to c, um, the complex number. All right, so let's write that. Okay. So for such a character, I mean, we recall, should have seen this before, but if you don't, didn't, then it's not too hard to prove. So a in f. Okay, so the um, the average of such a character, okay, over all over the entire field, it's got it's gonna be zero. Okay, and then that's that's um, well, it's because the sum over of anything finite group um, is zero. So that, that's that's why. So um, so then the bias. So I mean the definition. The bias of a tensor. T from V to D uh, F is the average. So bias of T is equal to the expectation of all X in V D. Oh, oh sorry, I mean if I <laughs> um this notation, if you haven't seen it before, it's it's just it's just this, so yeah, I'll write it for bias. So it's the expectation of LX and VD, chi of T, uh, X. Okay, and if you haven't seen this before, it's just the sum. It's 1 over um, the size of V to the D. It's, it's the average, right? So chi is in V to the D, chi of T. Okay, so that's that notation. Okay, um, so if... if, if uh, T is an order one tensor, okay? That means it's a linear function, it's a linear form. It's a linear function. You can take the sum all the way inside, okay? And then you get, and then you get zero. Um, does that make sense? So, if T is not, if, okay, so I'll just write that. If T is not identically zero, then the bias of t is equal to zero. Okay? Because that means, oh, sorry, t is order one. And obviously, because you can bring the sum all the way inside everything, and then just you get the sum of over a group is zero, and then you come back up and it's zero. All right? If t is, if t is identically zero, t uh, is identically zero. Then what do we have then? Bias of t is equal to one, right? Because if it's identically zero, then it's just one for everything, and you sum it up and you take the so you take the average of a bunch of things that are one, and you get one. Um. Okay. Now to see that the bias. Um, of a tensor is always between 0 and 1, okay, if you fix any x2 up to xd, this is going to be a really important formula actually, so I mean, um, fixing x2 to xd in v to the d minus 1, then, okay, the bias of t is equal to, well, it's the expectation of x2, all the way up to xd. I, I just pulled x1 inside. Uh, sorry, this is in v to the d. Um, oh, sorry, in v. Yeah, in v. x1 in v and chi t of x1 xd. Okay, so far I've done nothing except pull x1 inside. All right. But if you look at this, right, this is just... Um, 
whether, so it's just the probability x2, xd, and v. It's just the probability that this thing is identically zero, right? Um, um, I feel a little uncomfortable writing this. Like, I mean that this as a function of x1. So this is a function because x2 all the way up to xd is fixed. So this as a function of x1 is identically zero. Right, because that's what it means for this here. Um, right, if that's identically zero, we, we, we already saw up here, right, zero and one. Okay, so it's a probability. I mean, that's what I'm trying to say. So bias of t is a probability. So bias of t is in zero, one. Okay. Um, where it's a linear form that's not identically zero. Okay, and, and now we um, now we say the, the now finally the definition the analytic rank of a tensor is the quantity I call it arc or like analytic rank t is equal to minus log to the base size of f of bias of t okay and if you really want you can think of this as uh the bias of um one over t because this is a positive quantity um yeah i, I don't like the minus there because it makes it look negative but it's not so Okay, so uh, it's gonna be not it's gonna be not negative. Okay, and and so um, the last thing I'll just show is that the um, in the case d equals two, the analytic rank is once again equivalent to the ordinary rank. Okay? Um, to see this, suppose uh, t from f n squared to f uh, is given by t x y is equal to the sum of i equals 1 to r x i y i okay then the bias um the bias i guess then bias of t um is the probability that fixing y the linear form t um x, y. So, I mean, this is just in x because y is fixed, is identically zero. And this happens with probability. So, this is only when y is zero, right? So, uh, so the y as a vector is zero. This is the probability that y1 all the way up to yr is zero, which is um, one over size of f to r. Okay, and I mean, now we take the negative log of that and you get um, arg t is equal to r. Okay, so we kind of see that rank here is the same as, um, yeah, well, I mean, you gotta change it to this sort of diagonal. Um, this diagonal bilinear form sort of thing, um, and then you can see that it's the same. So we have, we have um, what do we have? We have the normal rank, um, we have the partition rank, and we have the analytic rank. And in the case d equals two, it's the same. They're all the same. Um, but when you get further, they're not going to be the same. And so what we're going to show in the next two videos is one, we're going to show that the um, 
the analytic rank of t is less than or equal to um, partition rank, and also that um, the analytic rank of t, if a is an independent set in t, is greater than or equal to c times the size of a. And so this kind of echoes what happened up here with the cap set problem, right? So we needed partition rank greater than the size of a if it's an independent set in t, and the partition rank is low. Okay, so here the equivalent of the analytic rank being low is that it's lower than the partition rank. Okay, so that means that already um, it's it's in a sense like more useful, um, and yeah, and the c here it's not one, but you can also bound um, the size of a an independent set, which you know has some link to the cap set problem by the analytic rank. Okay. So that's what we're going to show, and I mean, the, in the next video, I think we're going to spend um, a whole video just on one lemma, and then the third video will prove both of these statements. Okay, so I'll, I'll stop here.